Um, yeah. Yeah, so so you're in Cameron? Uh, yes, I moved uh, a little bit before November. Uh, I'm kind of a... In 2010, I heard this rumor that no matter how much money you make, you can't take it with you when you die. And at the time, I saw the King Tut uh, exhibit in Los Angeles, and he had a pyramid on his stuff. And his stuff ended up in the museum, not the afterlife. I said, you know what? If it doesn't work for King Tut or uh, Steve Jobs, it's not likely to work for me. Great. So yeah. I said, you know what? Instead of spending the rest of my life enriching myself, why don't I spend the rest of my life enriching the world? Mm-hmm. So I, I'm an engineer by training, and I said, well, what, can I, what problem could I fix? And at the time, there was $500 billion in student debt. Mm-hmm. And I go, oh, that looks, like, that looks like a challenging thing, and nobody's working on it. Weird. Huh. So I started the first, uh, I brought in all the open courseware from MIT, Stanford, UC Berkeley, Harvard, uh, India, and from around the world in a learning management, an open le- learning management system from Greece. It's called uh, eFront Learning. And I loaded it up on my host and I started inputting the lectures along with the tools, the textbook. Uh, kind of like when you would enter the test module, the quizzes, the clock would start ticking, you know, and it would cut off when the time was up. So it's almost like a, a virtual classroom, like uh, Blackboard or Moodle, mm. uh, but it was open software. And Moodle's uh, Moodle's uh, LMS is just a little too uh, too big of a footprint. It's not lean as far as its coding, and the eFront Learning allowed you to use a smaller hosting package and be able to service more people at a time. So uh, when I first started, everybody thought I was crazy. Like uh, in venture capital, it's called an outlier. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Two years after I started, two Stanford professors with $210 million in venture capital became my next door neighbor, Coursera. Mm -hmm. So venture capital validated the space. Then a year later, Harvard and MIT became my next door neighbor with edX, and they both gave $30 million each from their endowments. So now academics validated the space. So then what I did is I go, okay, so... Uh, it's nice to have, I don't like the term online or distance learning or remote learning, because when people do that, they do that in their bedroom at the library at a coffee shop. With a cell phone or a tablet, a laptop, you can go down to the tide pool study marine biology, go into a machine shop and, and study mechanics, uh, welding, uh, all different types of trades and engineering principles right in the space. So I s- then started to work on um, connecting to spaces, like maker spaces, bio labs. So in my course material, I required that 30% of their grade was to actually join a maker space in their community. Was, right. Tell me, tell me more about this. Is this is your teaching with who? Like, was this your company or what was this? Yeah, I, it's not, it's more of a project. Uh, because when I first started, I decided to live like Buddha or Jesus. You just talking about 2010? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Up until last November, I was homeless. Hmm. So I had a sleeping bag, sleeping behind a eucalyptus tree, and I wake up in the morning and then go to Starbucks and uh, continue working on the MOOC and uh, the th- three other projects that I'm working on, uh, two other projects. Um, so then I then started to work on um, connecting to spaces. And then about mm, 2000. Uh, 14 I said you know what uh, another problem that young people have besides student debt and learning is they get into their 20s and they don't know what they want to do mm-hmm. so and that I want to be a starts in elementary school I want to be a doctor I want to be an astronaut it abruptly ends in middle school when your friends say so what do you want to be oh I have been an astronaut oh you're not smart enough to be an astronaut so with my video camera I went out and interviewed three astronauts at Caltech and I said, what could elementary school kids get involved in for future space? They said hydroponics and robotics. So I went out to an aquaponics farm and filmed all the fun things you can do. Then I built a big database of all the community gardens, hydroponics, aquaponics in the world. Everything about them, kid friendly, because you don't want them to show up at a pot farm. 
kid friendly hours of operation youtube facebook instagram snapchat lay that in the layer in google maps as a young person is watching youtube video with the astronauts and the show and tell of the space they get excited at the end of the video a button pops up and says find a guard next to you they click on the button the map opens up local to them in cameron three blocks away on wednesday's family day they show up to the space they meet their mentor Two years later, they get to middle school, and the friends say, so what do you want to be? Oh, I want to be an astronaut. Oh, you're not smart enough to be an astronaut. The young person could say, well, for the past two years, I'm working on a variety of tomatoes to be considered for the Martian colony. I don't think you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So a young person's aspiration is like a spark in a campfire. When you, put, when you start a spark, you have to put your hands around it so the wind doesn't blow it out. But once it catches, then not even the wind or the rain can blow it out. So when a child goes through school with an aspiration in place, you never have to ask a child, have you done your dinosaur homework? Have you done your astronomy homework? Have you done your computer gaming homework or Minecraft? It's not a thing. So when they go through school with dinosaurs on the brain, they want to know about biology and botany. They also want to know about kinesiology, how do their dinosaurs move? They want to know about astronomy because a comet killed their dinosaurs. They want to know about geology because the dinosaur's bones are buried somewhere in geology, right? So they're going through school as a sponge. So I've, being homeless, I've interviewed over 90 celebrities like Senator Barbara Boxer, Tom Hayden before he died, Muhammad Ali's daughter, uh, who's a four-time boxing champion, Ed Asner, CIA agents, filmmakers, politicians, uh, you know, food scientists. I interviewed a four-time Olympian. Eight months after I interviewed her, she won the New York Marathon, first American woman in 40 years to win the marathon, right? So what I do is I then compile all that material. So the next step in my uh, evolution, you call yours like an ecology. I, it would be the same thing as learning ecology. So you get the young aspirations. You put them together with birds of a feather and mentoring space, right? So that, that that little spark can turn into a small ember or a flame, right? And then, then they go through school with letting curiosity drive the learning experience instead of uh, forced mandates from their parents and their teachers. Yeah. And um, uh, I don't believe in homeschooling. I don't believe in class schooling. I don't believe in uh, distance or online. I believe in community learning. And community includes the forest, the farm, the oceans, the museums, uh, people's homes, uh, the restaurants, uh, the uh, and, and classroom, community, all encompassing, and not just K twelve, but life learning. So uh, you know, like you took a, a turn from physics to you know uh, horticulture and, and you know and biology and you know mm -hmm. uh, metalworking stuff like that. So. Basically, I think that people should have the freedom to, in a sense, free range their learning, and then they get it. These this learning gets attached with assessments like the advanced placements, the CLEPS, the DSSTs, the NYU's, mm -hmm. and professional certifications like welding test, um, general contracting license, uh, you know, organic uh, agriculture certifications, and things of that nature. So as you're going through the process, you're learning about you know. Um, uh, no-till cultivation and prescribed grazing and, um, you know, in the local farm or in their backyard or whatever. And uh, it gets tied to a MOOC. Now, MIT is moving away from lectures mm -hmm. because the learning modality of lectures is 5 to 10 percent, sage on the stage. But they discovered that if they put the professors in the labs and the homework sessions, and let the MOOCs do the lectures, the assignments, the reading materials, things of that nature. And you set your laptop next to your, on your workbench and start working the circuitry. And you have guide on the side. So MIT is moving away from and They did a white paper about five or six years ago. So about eight, nine, maybe ten years ago, I was adopted by the open source, uh, open source movement in L.A., at one of the biggest, uh, it is the biggest open community uh, uh, conference called Scale, mm. right? And it's a Linux conference. It's open software. You got people from Blender coming from you know the Netherlands, you know, speaking 
uh, every March. And so they've adopted, they give me free booth space. I'm across the uh, aisle from Disney Imaginarium and uh, Facebook and Google, Microsoft and all that stuff. So I have the free space. So I have three projects. The first one is the MOOC. The second one is I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a physicist. I want to be an astronomer, whatever, right? The second project is called a smart city. It's, it kind of overlaps what I mentioned in the, you know, uh, a map of all the creative spaces. But in this situation, your family goes out for dinner and your child who's in third grade immersion studies is learning Mandarin. If she orders a meal in Mandarin to the Chinese speaking waiter, the family gets 10% off the menu. The child becomes a hero and gets a batch. And whenever she uses Mandarin in her community, because the map would show where the languages are spoken, you know, she, her badge increases in value. You go through a walk through a forest with your first grader. You give him your phone and it says, how many different types of trees, species of trees do you see? Take a picture. You give your tablet to uh, your fifth grader and say, what animals live in this environment? And you go for a quarter mile walk and you let their curiosity drive the learning experience, right? And uh, you pick up the phone from the first grader, you click it and you go, oh, looks like you found five of 10 different types of trees that are along this trail. You know, the next time you do that walk, he wants to do the other five, find the other five. The uh, uh, fourth grader is taking photographs of a worm or a caterpillar. She's done a Wikipedia search of photography and a video about the caterpillar. Next time she wants to find it in a chrysalis. Next time she wants to find it, whether it's a moth or a butterfly, right? So with augmented reality, um, I see a future when you go to the museum with your, three, your third grader and standing next to a Pablo Picasso painting is Pablo Picasso, right? So uh, the child goes up and says, well, what's your name? Oh, my name is Pablo Picasso. What's your name? Oh, it's Julie. Now, that could be stored in cash so that as soon as the session's over, it would be, you know, you know uh, uh, expunged for children. Uh, and then he said, would you like to know what I, how I got into art? And so Picasso would talk about his early childhood at age appropriate. So if she's third grade, he'd talk third grade. If he's in high school or college, a different level, right? So would you like to know what I was thinking when I did this painting? The next painting is Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci. And if the child likes dinosaurs, then a dinosaur appears miraculously in the art museum, right? So but basically, the uh, learning by experiencing yeah. in, 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 a, in a reenactment. So you go to a family outing to Gettysburg, and you're standing in the tree line. And standing next to is a, a Confederate soldier. He's chewing tobacco. He comes from a small town with small farms, no plantations, no slaves. But he's south of the Mason-Dixon. All of his family members are in the Civil War units, all, you know, whether it be uh, Lee or whatever. He starts talking to you, and he says, what do you think of the heart attack, right? And you get a, a nice conversation with him, and you look up and down the tree line, and you see the Confederate soldiers loading their muskets. And you see the cannon coming forward. You go, oh, my gosh, this is getting real. Next comes a, a, a soldier de decorated differently than everybody else, and he goes, okay, time to go, man. And so he says, yes, sir, Mr. Pickett. And so you're running through the field. You feel the grass uh, along your legs, you feel the wind bellow through your shirt, you feel the, the wind on your brow, and off to the right, you see a cannonball take out two Confederate soldiers. A little bit further, you hear whizzing going by your ear, not exactly sure what this is all about, but the guy that you were talking to gets gut shot, and he asks you to carry the colors for him, so you pick up the flag, and you press forward in, in Pickett's charge, right? And you can set that to PG, or Saving Private Ryan, right? for how whatever, maybe even have shell shot by the end of the augmented reality experience. At the end of the conf, at, you go into the uh, courtyard and all these uh, augmented reality uh, characters are, are standing around in their Sunday best, you know, arms are blown out, eye, you know, eyes patches, scars across the chest, maybe an, uh, you know, an amputee. And a guy gets up on a wagon and gives the Gettysburg address. Okay. So, of augmented reality and virtual reality, virtual reality, uh, you probably can't name a, a viral 
uh, virtual reality uh, game. Right? But you can, you, could, uh, you can name a viral augmented reality game. Pokemon Go. Right? So I see a bigger play in augmented reality because when you're VR, you're literally blind. You really can't go anywhere. But augmented reality will get so good that it'll be uh, a, uh, an opportunity for somebody to be on your farm but not be on your farm. Yeah. And going through workshops or history lessons, science lessons. You know, you could be inside of a cell with augmented reality. Yeah. You know. And so the, the biggest uh, thing I have to say is in Europe, uh, EU, the government funds universities at $9,000 a year per student. And then they charge no tuition in many of the countries. In the United States, the federal government uh, funds universities at $12,000 a year per student, right? And then they charge an average at a public school of 12000 on top of that. So, it's, so they're, they're like uh, $3,000 to $12,000, so $15,000 more than a European. And in Europe, the professors are paid well. They're paid a professional fee. In the United States, 76% of all the professors that teach at the universities are part of the gig economy, like an Uber driver. They have no health insurance. The average pay is $23,000 a year. They have masters and PhDs, and um, uh, a quarter of them qualify for and receive food stamps. Mm. A quarter of them. And they get paid less than kindergarten teachers. They have no union, right? Just, to uh, push back against the universities. And so they're kind of marginalized off to the side. They have no um, office on campus, no office hours and things like that. They get in their cars and they go from one university to another because the universities won't give them uh, either uh, three courses a semester or more. They have to pay, get the universities on the hook for health insurance. Mm -hmm. So they cut it off right at that thing where a adjunct can't qualify for it. So I would like to do, the reason I bought this building, and by the way, I didn't, uh, um, the, of the $250 a month that I live on for the past 11 years, um, since the United States government spends so much money dropping bombs on weddings and villages, that can't be good karma. So I wanted to include them on, in the MOOC project. So of the 250 a month, $191 is food stamps, right? So, and you know, $60, it cost me about $25 a month in hosting for the uh, MOOC. And um, so you're looking, I have 36,000 students around the world with no advertising budget. Um, uh, I, I cut it off, I cut my MOOC off just before COVID because I knew that my hosting service would get slammed and so uh, uh, fortunately edX picked up my torch that I gave them I don't know if you saw that video or not um, I asked a one minute question of edX yes. and you saw that saw so it. yeah so they uh, the founder uh, I didn't know it at the time but as soon as I asked Grace, he said I absolutely agree with you and I looked at the website a year later and I go oh they just added micro bachelors to their program <laughs> And then it blew up after during COVID. It went from like 20 million users to 34 million. That's twice as many uh, students as all the universities, trade schools in the United States, public, private, and community colleges. Mm -hmm. So I go, wow, you know. So I don't really have to maintain that so much. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get back in it. I still have all of. I still have my my SQL database, yeah. you know, for my ta tables. I can just put that up in a few short period of times. I have. I use the open edX software so I don't have to maintain the code base but so I bought this place in the middle of the United States I actually saw your video about four or five years ago and I reached out to you then I think um, but um, I just picked somewhere in the middle of the United States and I spent four or five months looking for property and what I did was I used the unemployment of California and the uh, 600 and the $1,400 or whatever uh, money that you get, right? And mm -hmm. I bought the building for $15,000, mm -hmm. right? 
And so I have about $3,000 to fix the building. It has a couple of uh, uh, settling things uh, in the building. I actually have a degree in civil engineering. And I have a... Did you do that before I have a, 2010? Or you just uh, yeah, I, I got that in 1980. I graduated from Long Beach State in civil engineering. There were so many Persians at the time uh, that a lot of the Persians didn't want to go back to Iran and Khomeini. So they stayed. And so there was a, a whole lot of Persians in civil engineering. Um, so when I was in college, I was working for a mechanical engineering company. And so I worked in mechanical engineering. And I, uh, like four or five years after getting out, I got my professional engineering license in mechanical engineering. So I graduated in civil engineering, and then I, I took a test at EIT and the PE in mechanical engineering. And I, I passed. I thought I failed. And I called up the state of California and said, I think you got this wrong. I'm pretty sure I failed this test. And he said, no, Mr. Williams, you passed it. I go, oh, you know. And I didn't. Uh, civil engineering uh, course material is not the same as mechanical engineering. It overlaps a little bit, um, but not, uh, not a lot. But I worked uh, many, quite a few years, but not a lot of years in um, engineering, working for building battleships for the Department of Defense. Uh, for a couple of years and working for design build companies making factories and stuff in mechanical engineering i did some electrical engineering as well um and enough computer science to get me in trouble on the uh web you know web servers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so so I'm, I'm working my next step is to uh start working on curriculum where students can work learn the basic uh rubrics of learning all the various different parts of the core of learning and um, from that uh, I thought the best way to do that is to be in a community so what I want to do is I want to do a proof of concept in uh, camera and it's a you might have seen the building it's a, a two-story uh, white building next to the farmers on third street it used to be Western Auto and it became a Photoshop a photo photography studio um, it's, uh, how should I say, it's about 8,000 square foot with like, you know, 12 foot ceilings or something like that. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is I want to do a machine shop. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a basement as well. Uh, one that has cement. I want to do the cement one that's got a, not tall ceilings. So I want to use that for wood shop and then, and bio lab. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then the next, and the other half, which is a larger section is, uh, I'd like to uh, dig out uh, the things undergird the, the footing walls and, and lay, uh, um, you know, footings in instead of, you know, because the rock walls just lay on soil. Mm -hmm. And it, it tends to settle because there's no rebarb to take up the tension, mm -hmm. the tensile load. So I like to put footings in to take up the tension so when the, when the soil settles, the whole wall settles, not a portion of the wall that caused cracking in the brick, you know, masonry. So I want to uh, take out the soil, make it a 12 foot or so for machine shops, vertical lays, CNC machines, things like that. And then the first floor, uh, dance, culinary arts, um, uh, film, photography. Um, on the second floor, um, you know, maybe electronics, circuitry, um, things like that. And in the detached garage, which is like a 25 foot by 20 foot wide uh, cinder block garage detached. I would like to uh, put in a forge, mm -hmm. uh, pottery, and glass blowing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a guy about in an apartment a couple of feet away that I just met in the middle of the winter. He's from Germany and he went through a three and a half year apprenticeship in blacksmithing. Mm -hmm. He didn't finish the last ha uh, six months. So I'd like to put him back into the, uh, bring, have him bring over his forge and his anvil so that he has a place to work in uh, to do, you know, uh, metalworking, old style, and then have a gathering group and document everything, you know, similar to what some of the other maker spaces have done, and um, uh, make it so that I'm going to start off easy with some of the tools that I already have, like, you know, woodworking, stuff like that. And then gradually work into uh, you know um, welding and things like that. I I've worked with stick, you know, buzz box. 
I've done a lot of uh, working on equipment, you know, all the things that I see you do in your shop, except I don't have, a, you know, a, a shear, you know, a, a power shear and stuff like that. But I like to find the bare minimum tools for a machine shop and let the membership donate or, you know, whether it be older equipment or, uh, you know, uh, other people that want to be attached to it. Now, once I do this, here's my idea. I would like to develop a charter university. So the $12,000 that comes in per student, right, would go into a space. Now, it, when an architect designs for a space, like a classroom, they design 15 square foot per student. But when they do a workshop, they design 100 square foot per student. So let's go with 100 square foot per student. So an 8,000 square foot building would be 80 students. Right? Mm -hmm. Let's just go with 50 because I got the math a lot easier. Twelve thousand dollars times fifty is six hundred thousand dollars, right? That's annual tuition or full program. Yeah, mm. for for a program, right? So you have uh, you have uh, six hundred thousand uh, dollars from state and federal coming into a charter school where it's trade and academics together. They're never separated, right? So the mechanical engineering student is working on a CNC machine and a CNC operator is lear learning about properties and materials from MIT. And they may not choose the calculus portion of you know, an engineering student's curriculum. Right. So um, what I would do is uh, the $12,000 would come in, 20% uh, would take away for administration, HR, uh, purchasing, insurance, so an, uh, a professor, a teacher, a mentor, uh, or a tradesman would not have to worry about the business part. They just check in, uh, work with their students on projects, and not be worried about that. So that leaves $500,000. Now in a tilt up building, warehouse, with uh, the dollar a square foot, you know, for a city, um, in a commercial area, would be $60,000 a year. So you take sixty thousand dollars from uh, uh, five hundred thousand dollars. You have four hundred for replication 000. purposes. You're saying for replication? Right. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Right now, I mean, I paid the building, so I don't even have to pay, you know, a rent or mortgage. Just a thousand dollars a year for property taxes, right? Mm -hmm. But in most places, they're not going to be that way, um, unless the building's donated by the city or you know a, a benefactor, you know, a philanthropist or whatever. But in the regular uh, majority of the cases, you have the 50 students come into the space, um, and you got five hundred thousand dollars take away sixty thousand, four hundred forty thousand dollars for capital equipment and teaching staff and supplies. So the twenty-three thousand dollars jumps up, right, um, to something like you know forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, right. And that leaves quite a bit of money for supplies, raw materials, uh, metals, and stuff like that. And so what a student would do is rotate from one space to another. So you might go from machine shop to wood shop to a farm. One might be, might be in South Dakota with a paleontologist digging out a T-Rex. Another month, he might be at Mount Palomar using uh, an, uh, a, you know, an observatory and do near-Earth objects. Or he might be at the Monterey Peninsula. What so, age group? This is high school age group? Uh, this would be, it could be a blend because there's kids that are 12 that could go right into college. The, there's a 19 year old that teaches mathematics at the University of Louisiana and she has her PhD. Yeah. 19 years old. So it's, it's up to whatever the person goes at their level. The problem in K-12 is the gifted and smart children get ignored in class because the teachers teaching the kids that aren't getting the material. Girls will sit quietly, but on the other hand, boys get ants in the pants. They uh, do spit wads, they do comedy routines, and maybe even a Broadway play, right? Because they're so bored, right? So what that ends up happening is a visit to the vice principal's office for a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, counseling. But if you have the kid with a MOOC class where he's, instead of studying in fourth grade, studying U.S. history with Mrs. Green, he said in U.S. history from Yale on his tablet. At the end of the semester, he takes a CLEP exam. 
because there's no age requirement for CLEPS. They're the brothers to the, to the APs from the college board. They're both from the college board. And there's 34 CLEP exams, right? So you can actually take a, a 12, take an hour test for 12 units of Spanish, French, and German. And, and three so units. So you're per saying anyone can do that? You don't have to be enrolled in a formal program or? No, yeah, exactly. Homeschoolers do it, you know, unschoolers do it, you know, um, senior citizens do it. It's called mm -hmm. CLEP, CLEP. Uh, so you, you'd actually, uh, you know, CLEP out, of a course. So when I was in Boston a couple of years ago, uh, I was at mm -hmm. a hotel where they let students work on their homework 24-7. And it was midnight, and I see this very young girl working at, at midnight. And I go, what are you doing? She said, I'm an 18-year-old graduate student. Oh, tell me your story. She said, when I was 15, I got the idea that I want to join the Marine Corps as an officer. And the earliest they'll take you is 20. So she wants to have her master's by the time she's 20. No. Oh. So she did a research as a 15-year-old because high school counselors not where the fuck. And she heard about the advanced, <laughs> advanced placements or CLEPs, right? So she got her bachelor's through the University of Southern New Hampshire in a year, and she's at Harvard graduate school finishing up her creative writing master's, right? So she said, normally when I ask people what they do, they never usually ask back. This little 18 year old said, what do you do? I, go, I was like surprised. I go, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty mature, right? And so I explained to her, and her eyes popped out. She goes, oh my God, I wish I had known about you. The problem is the media doesn't want to write about it. You know what I mean? Because it is a big issue. Um, Tell me you know, that's about the main why, reason why they don't want to write about it. Why, why not? Um, I think that they they prefer to have problems to write about. You know, if the problem goes away, there's nothing to write about. So student the student debt issue goes away, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't even they've never written about the adjunct problem. Seventy six percent of the professors <laughs> are teaching that way, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't want to write about this stuff, and um, I've reached out to them on the phone. Mm. I've reached, uh, even on other people's programs, like in California, I uh, called up the, uh, the editor at the LA Times of Education. I talked to him on the phone, I said, do you know that Cal State Dominguez Hills program allows students to earn six units a year, uh, semester in their junior and senior year, right? Six units a semester for three dollars and fifty cents, less than a frappuccino, <laughs> and that's a right. So by the time you by the time you graduate with twenty four units for fourteen dollars, that's less than mowing one one lawn. You know what I mean? Fourteen dollars. So you have like thousands of dollars worth of college credit, and this is above AP. So college credits APs here, and college credits. You know, you can transfer college credit a lot easier. So you can earn 14 units. And the, that, was any, that was Cal State Dominguez Hills program called Young Scholars. It was on TV. So anybody in California could get those credits, right? And the education editor wouldn't write about it. And I, I, I then went to the reporter and I talked to him and he wouldn't write about it. So it's like I'm wasting my time with mainstream media and the same um, for uh, uh, the conservatives too. They're pretty deaf to the whole thing too. But I went. To, I don't know if you know who the think tank it is for the progressives, because I was a progressive for quite a few years. I even phone bank for Bernie Sanders. Do you know who the most the spokesperson for the progressives is? No. Robert Reich mm -hmm. from Berkeley. He's the most senior. He's the most senior professor at UC Berkeley. And he has the TV program, and he has an hour, he has like seven seven million followers on Facebook. He's a real short guy, he used to work um, for uh, uh, Clinton as a labor secretary. He's got like a midget thing, but he's short and he puts his tools. You've seen him on television, you've seen him on television. Right, so I asked him that question when I met him personally. And I said, Robert Reich, in the Europe, they give $9,000 a year per student, right? And uh, the United States gives $12,000, and we charge $12,000 on it. I says, do you see the Democratic Party have a pathway 
to make our universities as efficient and to pay the professors a professional wage? And he said, no, because our universities are better than Europeans. And I disagree with him because he just got to talking about an hour and 15 minutes of it was when he was in a boat going across the ocean from Yale, getting deathly seasick in his cabin. I mean, like almost dying on the ocean, right? And his classmate, uh, Bill Clinton, came up with chicken noodle soup to find out if he was okay, right? To go on the road scholars. So let me get this straight, uh, uh, Robert. You, you spent three or four days going on a slow-moving boat, getting deathly sick to go to inferior Oxford and Cambridge? What, why'd, you, why'd you just stay in the United States? You know, if they're better here, then why, why'd you go to Europe? Right? So, I mean, even in his... But I was in an event honoring him, so I didn't bring that up. But it was right there in his presentation. I could have, I could have uh, you know, basically said, what the hell are you talking about? Are you a complete moron? You just spent 15 minutes of the last conversation talking about, you know, suffering to go to on the road scholars to Europe. There's universities in, in, in Europe are excellent, many of them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, they produce scientists that we all know, you know, like um, Oppenheimer. They're, and they're more efficient there. What's the secret? I think that, uh, well, part of the problem in with the administration, just to give you an example of, of the pay, um, we talked about $24,000 a student per year, right? Uh, government money and tuition, that's 24000 a year. The average student takes four years to go through school, you know, when it's not, you know, log jam. Uh, that's 10 classes a year. 10 into 24,000 is $2,400 a student. The average class size is 50. Sometimes it's 150, 200 in the large sessions, right? And sometimes it's 30, but the average is 50. 50 times $2,400 is $120,000 for that one class per semester. One million. No one, no one hundred and twenty thousand. See, uh, twenty five hundred dollars okay. times fifty students okay. is one hundred twenty thousand dollars, right? Okay. For that one semester class, right? They then turn around and pay the professor twenty eight hundred dollars to teach the class. My question is, what happened to the hundred seventeen thousand? Right. So the professors are getting three percent of these uh, of these things, and the reason is is they spend so much in a- uh, administration. There's sports teams. So in Europe, they don't have co- uh, college teams. They have club teams for soccer and, and you know, other things. So if you want to uh, participate, they don't have it attached to the university. Right. In fact, actually, it does a disservice to the college, uh, the student athlete, because uh, an athlete is spending a great deal of his time conditioning and practice and playing. He has very little time to do any rigorous studies. And so he has to have a tutor, a, a separate individual tutor for him to go along with him on his trips to different away games and things of that nature. Just And, and he's also cons- he's got his, his, his mind is in the game because he's worried about keeping his grades up so he stays qualified for the NCAA or whatever, right? And also, they don't get money for performing. They get free education, but a lot of times it's in psychology, sociology, and that's a crowded field. That's not a place you can actually get a job, you know, at the bachelor level. You know, you have to go to graduate level. And even with a graduate degree, psychology, you know, you get 40000 a year, you know, with a graduate degree. Mm-hmm. You know, but you get a bachelor's in engineering and, you, you know, you're sixty, seventy, eighty thousand, 80000 right? Mm-hmm. But they, they, can't, they can't spend any time in, in, in courses that require a great deal of homework and uh, pairing pulling your hair out with calculus, right? So a lot of kids, the pro- we, have, we have a lot of problems in education. Uh, one of them is uh, math. Uh, that's the biggest problem we have in K-12. Um, when kids go, STEM and STEAM, you've heard those terms, sure. are full of shit. That's all crap. It's full of crap, and I'll tell you why. When co- kids go to college and they decide what major they want to do, they never say, what major can I do where I don't have to do any science, technology, or engineering? They always say, what major can I do where I don't have to do any math? Oh, I can be a school teacher. And then we push them back in our K-6, 
and wonder why we're 36th in the world in math. Because we have math-phobic teachers pushing them back in K-6, right? I don't think a phobic math person should even come in contact when it comes to math. Because they just ha they have a great deal of empathy, empathy for failure in math. Also, the problem <laughs> is, is, the problem is, yeah, I got to, and I get, now I'm going to get into math. The problem with math is, uh, primarily calculus, all right? These kids have never tried calculus, right? So they're not, a, they don't know if it, they can, if they'll excel in it or not. So it's like a child when you first give them spinach on a plate, they look at that big mound of spinach, they go, oh, I'm not eating that. So what the parents do is they fit the spinach into the bacon and cheese in a quiche and they slip it into their child. And the child ends up loving it. And about a year later, they say, by the way, kids, that's 98% spinach. So you have to put it in a way that's edible and it'll get past their radar, their gross radar. So what you do with calculus is you fit it into developmental math, algebra, trigonometry, trig and all of the other stuff. So they're doing it without realizing they're doing it. And so I'll give an example. Um, you know, when you teach kids in developmental math uh, distance and you start measuring your feet and, you know, you get a tape measure and you start measuring distance and, and they start to get from there where they get success in that. Then you go into the area, area, flat surface area. You say, okay, one foot by one foot. You, by definition, kids, that's, we call that one square foot, right? And so you say, okay, that's one square foot. Okay, so let's put one more next to it. And you ask the kids, okay, how many square feet is that? Oh, they say two. You never, don't give them the answer. You let them answer it. Then you put two more in there, right? And you wait for them to answer. How many square feet is that? Oh, it's four. Oh, my God. You guys are incredible. You guys are area masters with the squares. It's time to move on to a new surface. We're going to put a circle inside those four squares. And it touches the midpoints. But the, it doesn't go, it's not outside, it, it's inside the square. And you ask the kids, okay, so what's, what's the area of the square? And they say four square feet. Okay, good, good. Or four square meters, four square miles, it doesn't matter. So, uh, is a circle four squares feet? And you look, no, no. I mean, you got these areas on the sides. Hmm. I wonder how we find out the area of this, this circle. And you walk away. Two days later, three days later, say, okay, have you guys got a solution? Yeah, we could take smaller squares and it touch the circle and the, the outside of the square, the big square, and go smaller and smaller to infinitely and beyond because they know Toy Story and take it away from four. And you get 3.1.4, you get the pi. So you don't give them pi r square, you give them a, pro a puzzle. And you start to do that throughout, you know, when you're talking about, uh, if I ride my bicycle and I go over a ramp three bricks high, how far will I fly? And so they learn physics and calculus, right? And so you, you introduce that into physical things that they have uh, personal experience with and it becomes practical math. Well, of practical. course, then the next, next step to that is experiential learning where you throw all that right. out and do it with real world problems. Right, exactly, exactly. And so, um, you know, Khan Academy is nice, but I think that there's a, a lot better way of approaching math. You know, so when you get, so when you have that success in math, because you can throw money at, at a problem uh, but it won't work because we spend more money on education than everyone in the world. And we're number two behind Liechtenstein per student. Mm -hmm. But we're 36 in math and 26 in science and 20th in literacy. So mm -hmm. what I want to do is I want to disrupt uh, K-12, make it life learning, and have kids go at their own, um, at their own pace, and, you know, whether it be dinosaurs, whatever it is they, they are inspired. You know, they can always change their mind. Right? You want like to do this with, your the, mind. with this prototype and then scale it? So the Cameron prototype exactly. and scale it? Exactly. What kind and of include, future are you, you know, looking at? What's, what kind of roadmap are you looking uh, at? Well, uh, right now, what I'm looking at um, is I stayed away from venture capital Naturally. because venture capital becomes your boss. And I stayed away from grants because they yeah. can also be micromanagers. And I just funded it with welfare from the government, right? 
So what I'm hoping to do is do crowdfunding from the community, not from outside the community. But you so implied, that they have you implied somewhat of a, what we talk about is the bootstrapping approach, where the tuition then pays for the infrastructure that's built up. Is that right? How exactly. You're looking at it, or? First, yeah. What I've done is I've been reaching out to the GOP because they are uh, fix, uh, trying to fix the in urban area problems with better schools in black and, and, and Latin communities. They're trying to fix it. Whereas the Democrat Party is stuck with the unions, which uh, the, the teacher unions. And the teachers' mm -hmm. unions are only interested in the matters and the concerns of teachers, not students. They're not fighting for parents or students. They're only interested in their insurance mm -hmm. or health insurance. They're only interested in never being fired. And they're only interested in their pension. Okay? And, and, and nowhere in the teachers' union's mission statement is education uh, their concern, okay? So charter yeah. school, there's a lot of teachers that, you know, want to go out and teach, and then they have to join a union, and then they get uh, by association. See, let me tell you a little bit. I worked two years in the government, right? So Same. I know something about, yeah, right? <laughs> so I know something about government workers from that two years. What I learned is that the reason people go for a government job is because of job security, a, a good pension, right, and health insurance, mm -hmm. right? And so that type of person is somebody who is fear averse, sure. who's a little bit of scaredy cat, right? They're a scaredy cat. They, they can't go rough and tumble into the woods, right? <laughs> and so all of the other federal employees are also of similar nature. So you have all of these worry works living, working in the same departments, <laughs> sharing all of their bad behaviors amongst each other and they have a lot of sympathy there's not anybody out there that's going to rock any boat right so the government itself breeds almost like a uh a socialist um communist environment that's why communism failed in russia is because the community uh, the community farms the you know the community farms underproduced their acreage and um, all the food that people in Russia ate was from this one acre plots that each farmer was given uh, you know in his backyard and so they would produce all the vegetables and sell it on the black market because if you went to the, uh, the government store you'd be standing in lines and you go up to one person said I like a piece of bread you give your money you get a ticket and you had to go through this long process to get one loaf of bread so the farmers would make the extra money from their little acre plots, right, or a quarter acre, whatever, you know. Was, but they basically fed Russia just from their small little farm because they did not participate. See, the communism, small c is good. It's like people said, okay, we're, we choose to join a commune, right, and we choose to go there. Uh, uh, Capital C, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, you know, Angola, uh, you know, China and Russia. Capital C, that's a nation, and you're forced to do it. If you live in that country, you have to be a communist. You know, Russia of the old days, right? So, communism small C is you make the choice to join the commune. Large C is it's imposed upon you, and people don't. Um, even if it's good for you, they do not. They get lazy as hell when it's forced on them. But they're industrious as hell. Like me, I'm very industrious, and I'm making you know two fifty a month in food, uh, one ninety one in food stamps, right? Tell me more about your uh, why you chose this lifestyle at that time. Like, are you religious or stuff like that, or spiritual? Um, I uh, yeah, in the past, I went to seminary. I went to the Institute of Holy Land Studies in Israel. I spent six months traveling through Europe, studying uh, church history, going to all the archaeological and you know historical sites and then I also went to uh, Biola uh, the master's program and but I decided uh, um, this is the second time I've lived like Buddha right this is the second time first time I did it when I went to Europe uh, for six months and I gave up twenty five thousand dollars of money that I worked on the Alaska pipeline I traveled to Europe with no money whatsoever <clears throat> sleeping under you know tractors one night I was sleeping on the beach in Greece yeah. in Salonica got woken up in the middle of the night because a rat was chewing on my hair uh, just a lot of stuff you know I didn't know where I lost a little weight um, 
you know, driving six months with no money. And that was back when Yugoslavia was a thing, right? And the, the Iron Curtain was still up. So, uh, so I, I went through that, you know, early on. And then um, I went into my entertainment company, you know, did carnival rides and things of that nature and, you know, built a business of 36 years. So I have a lot of the background on how to uh, do a business. I have the engineering experience. I have the, the workshop experience and the employment employee having employees now i've never had an employee ever complain they got paid too much but that's again right and you know when you start a business you're not the boss every single customer is your boss right so you, you trade one one boss for many bosses and you don't work nine to five you work five to nine you know that's what you chose right and as a boss, you're responsible to make sure that all your employees make enough for their families so their families don't starve. That's, and I used to pay my employees before I paid my mortgage. Right? So it's, it's not, a, a, starting a business is not exactly fun. You know, It's a challenge, you learn a lot of things. So I can, uh, my grandmother once told me, watch after the pennies, the dollars take care of themselves. That's kind of what I like about you, do, you know, doing for the farmers because the farmers are going to need these kind of things, but there's a couple of uh, learning hurdles that you have to do. It's taken them a while to move away from tilling to no-till cultivation, and now they're starting to embrace it. Right? Are you, are you looking at, uh, so from our perspective, we're saying, okay, we want to create alternative education or create immersion learning experience. Yeah. For yeah. us, it's going to be explicitly, okay, we're going to just take one one global issue and solve it after another uh, so very right. directed focus that you want to solve solve things are how are you addressing that issue in in your kind you're thinking how you're going to set up your program okay well how am i going to set my program up because i'm going to go back in ancient history and look at how the medicis did their artist residencies hmm. right where the art and, and the greeks did their lyceum the greek lyceum right so i actually spent a month in in florence where the Renaissance happened. And the Renaissance just didn't just do art, they did architecture, they did that dome on the church, which was a, uh, a physics problem, right, of construction. Uh, they did uh, medicine, they did astronomy, they did lots of things besides art. So I'm looking at that particular thing without the Medicis in, in the ecosystem. I wanna see if I can do it organically from the community. And then the community then takes a, a portion, like, a, I don't know if you've ever heard of sourdough. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, when they would go up to Alaska and they'd take a little bit of sourdough and they'd pinch off a piece of it, make, take flour and water and make more sourdough, but kept a little bit of stuff. So what I'm hoping to do is to use this school to half fund another school in another community, right? And one or two of the people from this school goes to that school. And then the two schools the next year yeah. fund two more schools. And then those four schools fund eight schools. And then if I can get the government involved, which right now I'm, I'm, um, I've got about quite a few lawmakers that I've got connections to. Um, I've got the lawmaker in California. He's a, his wife is... A, House of Representatives just won last year, but this last election. And he was the senior most person for the GOP for two years for California, right? And he was the guy that wrote uh, um, uh, the petition to get Gray Davis out, and they brought in Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? So he actually got a governor thrown out of office. And he did a lot of other things, but his, his main job is, is law. And um, so I started a relationship with him because I helped his, him um, fight against Wikipedia and keep his Wikipedia page up, right? So I got him that up. So I've, I've developed a relationship over a year and he's invited me to go back to the GOP planning meetings. They have one in the spring and one in the winter and the fall. You know, they, and that's where they develop their platform, like uh, on their platform is, is tool choice, 
right? Mm -hmm. Where kids in the urban areas can decide to go to a, a public school that's failing, or they can go to a charter school, right? So the biggest union in the United States today, guess what it is? The biggest union, as far as money and, and, and people. K-12 teachers. It's bigger than the military lobbying group. It's bigger than any other union. Hmm. And, and as a result, they are so afraid of losing their, their funding because when a child leaves the district, he takes a portion of the funding money away from the district. Right? But you're doing such a poor job. Why would you want, you know, to have your students go through that? And right now they're told if, if they're from of European descent and they're male, that the scum of the world and all they were doing is they were just bought into the world through an egg and a sperm. Why should they have a, a black mark on them just simply because they come from Europe, right, and they're male, or female for that matter. So it's a toxic environment for young boys, and uh, boys fail four times more often. So when it comes to funding, um, it has to be brought up through, most likely through the red states, not so much the blue. They're stuck on stupid, the blue states. They really are, uh, sadly. Um, they say believe the science, but none of those none of those fuckers ever went to, never went into the STEM field. They're all humanities majors, right? If you fa if you are failing if you are failing as an engineer, oh, this might go up on the internet. Okay, I got to be careful what I say, right? So, if you're failing as an engineering student, you know what the engineering students do? What? They change their major into education so they can get back on the dean's list. You know that's true. Come on. Yeah. All right. So. So, I mean, I've watched so many YouTube videos where they're the young engineering student is showing showing the hack of how they got the grades back up again <laughs> from the, from washing out. So the thing is, is that we as you know, as 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 people that are in those fields, we can help those people, you know, uh, come in because that's what we're a shortage of. We're a shortage of. We need to get away from building bombs and and you know other types of things and work on the warp drive. I mean, that's a, a pretty good size project. That's bigger than the Manhattan Project. If you could figure out a way to develop the warp drive with all the energy required to create the field and, and to warp space, time, so that you're more massive than the sun, whatever, right? Or you figure some other way of piercing, piercing the, you know, the, the fabric of time, if that's really a thing, right? But think about that. If you had uh, young kids and old people all working together in creative spaces all connected through slack so that they're all doing open uh, citizen science working on big projects in bio labs in you know in astronomy and things of that nature they may yeah. come up with a, a, a out of the box way of solving a problem yeah right? no that's so yeah, yeah. exactly so, yeah so the thing I, I'm a uh, uh, I, when I was going through school, I was in 26 schools, right? So I was always the new kid in the, in the school. So um, that's why uh, I pick up concepts pretty quickly. Because yeah. the curriculum always changed when you went from one school to another. Yeah, yeah. So how do you get the funding? The first thing is a proof of concept so you can show people without funding. And then if you get the state support, you could get $6,000 per student, Right. So it doesn't have you to go you through. You know, kind of trying to stay away from the welfare. You still see the states being part of that, or are you? Yeah, I think that the states could add to uh, to it in a positive way, as an avenue for for college. So you have uh, there's a couple of things when it comes to college and trade school. All right, and um, I'm not. I believe that when kids leave, when they leave high school and they go off into the world. The kids that go to college look at the kids that go to trade school as being on the short bus. And the kids on the short bus think they're on the short bus. So what we have is a prestige gap. So what I suggest is we don't separate them. We keep them together, as I mentioned earlier, right? So we keep them together so, so that they're not in opposition, but you have design and production working together, you know, working on individual projects, whether it be, you know, a CubeSat, you know, 
because um, it'll be inexpensive after a while to have a cube set and not just around the uh, the earth but maybe around the moon or, or mars or saturn or whatever right and um so i believe citizen science can work together and nations can work together so that we can colonize the solar system right sure. and work work out the gravity issues and the radiation issues mm -hmm. right and uh you know uh when I was talking to, you know, various different people, it's all with it. It's all in our wheelhouse. If I were to get federal uh, state money, because I think state money is could be easier, mm. right? Than going through a federal government where half half the country is, you know, uh, tied to the, the teachers unions, right? You're not expecting um, so many men. states to do it at five or six. Let me ask you this, so when you said like 50 times 12 before, right, that 12 wasn't from students paying? No, it's no tuition. So you solve the tuition problem, you solve the, uh, uh, the learning modalities, you solve the, uh, uh, the, how should I say, the learning modalities, the professor pay, you solve that problem. And more importantly, all of the students' work is on research. Right. How many discovering for the say the eight thousand square foot in Cameron? How many staff would you have there? How probably many uh, teachers? three or four. Yeah. See, I I would probably have like uh, let's like say for instance that blacksmith guy. Right. Mm -hmm. He's he's just he's just excited to be working on the forge. So he'd actually be kind of like, uh, you know, uh, a uh, a craftsman. Right. So you'll have students when a student turns around and teaches another student what he's learning learning by teaching it jumps up to 60 percent learning modality so um i would have phds one or two right and then the rest would be teach a student teaching each other with the socratic method right i did mention the greek lyceum so have the the in education you have project-based design-based and experiential learning at 50 percent learning modality the socratic method uh is 60 percent in education, the only time you use the Socratic method is in kindergarten and law school. 60% right. of what? 60% uh, learning modality is Socratic method. What do you mean by 60% learning modality? That means mastery of the subject. It's when a kid turns around and teaches another kid how to tie his shoes. As he teaches the kid how to tie his shoes, his brain has to go through a mental, because somebody else doesn't have the same mental understanding. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do it in such a way, it's kind of like E equals MC squared. In other words, it, you boil it down to such an, a, a concept that uh, people can understand it. So the Socratic method is you have to do homework here to, to be able to log into somebody else, right? Where's this number 60 come from? Um, it's research that was done over, actually there's a couple of pro uh, projects and white papers on that called the Socratic method there's quite a bit of books published by, about it as well Socratic method it's from Socrates but it goes way back in in um, in a situation where you don't have lectures but you have this interaction these quizzes and puzzles and and you know the teacher not being there so mm -hmm. the Socratic it's what you're doing right now I mean you don't know shit about uh, you know welding at one time right mm -hmm. so you, you taught somebody then you turn around and teach somebody else right so you're transferring that knowledge. In that transferring of that knowledge, you, you gain a better understanding. Oh, yeah. That's why the fucking, that's why all the fucking physics professors are so fucking smart. That's like the tenth time they taught that class, right? And you go, God, that's fucking, that guy's fucking crazy smart, and he's not even reading any notes. <laughs> he's just scribbling on like five chalkboards, you know. And just when I see when when they were when, in calculus, when the professor was doing the proofs. I was trying to find a, a place where they fucked up and they made a mistake so that I could disprove Newton and the German that developed calculus, right? So this little guy could disprove calculus. That was what the purpose, following the proof, to see where he's going from one step to another so that I could disprove the, the whole idea of calculus, right? That was my... But everybody else is just phasing out. They're just like, yeah, whatever, mm. you know. They, but I was actually following along the formulas. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So, so uh, go ahead. I was, was so going to say. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know where the funding is going to come from. 
but I have irons in the fire. So if it comes at the state level, if it comes at the national level, or if it comes in the community, right? Yeah, well, maybe, I don't know how we, if you want to entertain what we're doing, but right now we're, we're going to do a three-month immersion program for builders for the CD Co home, and how do you, how yeah. do you pay for it? We build homes. Right, exactly. Like, you know, in your situation, you just have a bunch of tents and, you know, in, in, in the South 40, right? And you have uh, well water that you bring to them and uh, you just, you know, you go at it, right? That's where I think MOOCs are helpful. So, like, if we take your content, put it into a MOOC, then you do workshops because people... Can you hear me? You cut out there. All right, maybe call it right there. Good discussion.